chess friends i welcome you to this chess video and a very wonderful game from yesteryear of 1898 and the game was played in vienna austria and with white pieces is carl august walbrot and with the black pieces is very famous american master harry nelson pillsbury and he's famous not only for his epic battles with uh, world champion emmanuel lasker but for his sensational blindfold play, where he took on many people, blindfolded and demonstrated not only his chess prowess, but his imaginative powers as well. So let's get into the game, it's very instructive for us. And as was the style of the times, it's a king pawn opening, an e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, and bishop b5. And once again we have Roy Lopez. Pillsbury played knight to f6 and here White plays the move d3. Now this move contains a threat, not a very th subtle threat but a threat nevertheless and I wonder if you can see what it is. Well let's give Black a move. Let's say he tries to kick the bishop with e6. White will take the knight on c6. Black is forced to retake and white, of course, wins a pawn with knight takes e5. Not a very subtle threat, but a threat nevertheless. In the game, Pillsbury played bishop to c5. And this, in fact, parries White's threat of winning a pawn on e5. I wonder if you can see how this is done. Well, let's imagine it in our minds. Bishop takes c6, pawn takes c6, knight takes e5. What is our next move? That's right, queen to d4. Hitting the knight that is now on e5 and the pawn on f2 and threatening checkmate. Let's play it out on the board. Bishop takes. Pawn takes. Trying to win a pawn but Queen comes to d4 with devastating effect. Hitting the knight and hitting the f2 point. So Pillsbury recognised White's threat and played the wonderful move Bishop to c5 which parries that threat. And here, white played knight to c3, a normal developing move. Instead of this move, white can try for a strategic advantage. Let's put in the, the move back. I wonder if you can see a move that would attempt to gain some type of strategic advantage for white. What about the move bishop to e3? Trying to induce black to swap off bishops. Because after bishop takes e3, f takes e3, you can see that the f file is now opened. And in conjunction with a bishop, a 
could prove to be a strategic advantage. And not only that, but you can see that black is now deprived of the d4 square for a knight and the f4 square for a knight also. He has no real outpost in the centre. And white could have attempted this with the move bishop to e3 instead of playing the normal developing move. But knight to c3 is it's okay, it's good enough. But it does not necessarily lead to a strategic advantage. Black played d6, bishop g5, h6. The bishop came back trying once again to, or trying in fact rather to induce black to swap off. But Pillsbury correctly simply keeps attention. Why should he develop wipes game for him by taking on e3? It doesn't make any sense. So he played bishop to b6. And here white tries an interesting idea. He plays the move a4. Now, first of all, what is the idea behind this move? Well, simply white is going to swap off his bishop for the knight, play the move a5, and try and get black, or try and induce black rather, to swap off the dark square bishops, trying to get that strategic advantage that we looked at before. I don't think it's particularly going to be successful because even once the F file opens, it would appear to me that it would be much better to have a light square bishop on the board where it could operate along this diagonal. And so aiming to swap it off for the knight on c6, I don't think can lead to much of an advantage. But it's an interesting idea nevertheless. Let's see, let's see what transpires in the actual game. Black castled. White carried out his idea. Bishop takes on c6. B takes on c6. a5. Literally forcing black to swap off the dark square bishops. Pillsbury takes. Walbrot takes. And the rook comes to the open file. Then let us evaluate what has transpired after this series of events. We can see that white, sorry, black rather has a beautiful file, half open file for his rook. He has castled, he has an active knight in the game. He has in fact a slight lead in development. White, okay, has taken the d4 square away from black, but there's no longer a knight here anyhow. And this pawn here on a5, while not being literally isolated, it is virtually isolated because the pawn here cannot advance to protect it. His king is still in the centre, he has not posted his queen, he has not connected his rooks and black as we have said has a slight lead in development so rather than favoring white it in fact favors black now if you were black in this position what what plans do you have at your disposal when well, we know that white is lacking in development his king is still in the center so we should try and open up the position because our lead in development should tell if we can open up the position. And the way we open up the position is with pawn levers. And we have a pawn lever here if we play d6 to d5 or f7 to f5, trying to open the position. And this is the reason why Pillsbury played the move, knight to g4. Wonderfully dynamic move. Not only is it hitting the pawn on e3, it facilitates the advance 
of f7, f5, opening up the position, and it's a provocative move. It's provoking white to play h2, h3, inducing some weakness in his position. Okay, the queen must defend. Queen goes to e2. Black carries out his idea of opening the position to facilitate his advantage in development. Pawn takes, bishop takes, and e4. And the bishop simply drops back with bishop to e6. Here is a, almost a critical point, although it looks essentially innocuous. White feels he is induced to play the move. H3. Now what do you think of this move, chess friends? H3. Well, let's be quite frank. The knight on g4 is quite annoying. It is, it is hitting a lot of important squares. And it's desirable that we negate its influence in our position. But do you think the move h3, can you envision any problems that might arise as a result of this move? Well, let's, look, let's look one move forward. Let's look at, of course the knight must move, and the knight goes to f6. This knight here is destined to come to h5 and to f4 where it will become an absolute monster. And the problem for white having played h3 is that it will be very difficult to play g2, g3, taking some control over the outpost in f4. Because of the weakness of the h3 point. And you'll see this demonstrated in this game, friends. It looks harmless and innocuous, even desirable to kick the knight. But it creates some serious weakness. Which black, artistically I would say, exploits. Queen comes to e3. Black curtails its diagonal while playing c5. Black, white castles. And the knight comes to h5. Eyeing this beautiful and powerful outpost on f4. Of course white realises the importance of this and he tries knight to e2. Trying to negate the influence of the knight which has found a home in h5 and very soon will come to f4. And here black plays a very, very instructive move. Plays the move g5. Now why is g5 a much stronger move than simply playing the knight to f4 immediately? And the answer is after knight takes, pawn takes, we can see that black, sorry, white rather will be able to get some play in the centre. He will be able to play a move like e4, e5, trying to break up some of these pawns. He'll get counterplay in the centre, essentially, if we play the knight to f4 immediately. And for that reason, Pilbury plays the brilliant move, g5 first, because he will recapture on f4 with a pawn, denying white counterplay in the centre. Beautiful, beautiful move. Okay, king comes to h2. He is, of course, trying to play the move g2, g3, shoring up the very weak and vulnerable f4 point. Black simply negates this idea. You can see how difficult it is for white to play the move g2, g4. Sorry, g2, g3, because of the weakness that we have mentioned of the h3 point. White tries to shore up the weakness with knight to g1.
on Black Plays Night F4 anyway. Realising that it's virtually impossible for white to play g2, g3. Knight takes, pawn takes, and the queen must move. Okay, the f file has been blocked, but a new open file has arisen, the g file. And black makes immediate use of this. He moves his king to h7, facilitating the use of the g-file. And it's a very wonderful example, friends, of the positional power of having control of important files. Because control of these files coupled with tactical threats literally wins this game for black. It's very, very instructive for us uh, to behold and learn from this. G3, uh, I'm not really sure what the motivation for this move is. I suspect that White realises that, that Black will very soon take control of the G-file. And it's simply an attempt to get a file for himself. He'll either try to contest the F file or contest the G file somehow. F takes G3 with check. Queen takes and the rook comes to the G file. Queen goes to E3 and the queen comes to G7. Threatening, of course. Checkmate. Rook F2. And rook b8, taking advantage of the fact that this rook cannot move. Rook to f1 and rook to f6. And black is simply going to triple on the g file. Where, as we have said, coupled with tactical threats against the weak h3 point, white is going to suffer for a very long time to come. Knight e2 is practically about the only move that white has at his disposal. Tripling on the g file, queen f3, and this beautiful move, rook to g5. Why is this a more po what is the idea behind this move, chess friends? Well, quite simply, this was the idea. White, sorry, black is threatening to take on h3 and simply deliver checkmate by bringing his rook to the h file. And white will simply have to impose his queen. He'll either lose the game or he'll lose his queen. King h1 was tried. Bishop takes h3. And after this move, white in fact resigned. Because if he moves the rook, well, he'll get mated. If the rook moves somewhere else, so he had no rook c1. After this move, he's rook is going to come here, and he's either going to lose his queen or be be mated. His his situation is hopeless, and he resigned. After bishop takes h3. So a wonderful example, I thought, of combining tactical threats with the positional exploitation of open files. In this instance, first the F file and then tripling on the G file. And some nice positional ideas that we can learn from. 
And especially look at this weakening move that White played. H2, H3. Because it looked innocuous enough, but it in fact was critical and almost sealed his doom. Because as we can see, the knight lodged itself on F4. And the weakness of this point made it essentially impossible for White ever to play G2, G3. And when he did play G2, G3, it had devastating consequences. So very nice demonstration of these themes by uh, Harry Pillsbury. And I sincerely hope that you got something from it. We'll continue on with another game in this series, chess friends. And I thank you once again for taking the time to watch this video. So take care and I sincerely wish you well with your own chess. Be out of your brilliant mind.